Hey guys, I am so excited to announce that the movie that you've been waiting for, the documentary Dr. Patient, is now available for rent or purchase at drpatientmovie.com. Check out the trailer here. When I really knew something was wrong was when I started having trouble walking up the stairs. I was supposed to be grateful and happy and healing and well and thriving, but I did not feel that way. I was so sick. Like always, I wanted to find an answer and I had to figure it out, and I had to figure it out to save my own life. So I dove in. Jill is the leading voice in biotoxin illness and chronic conditions that are driven by toxicity. Oh my gosh, you're dealing with mold? You have to work with Dr. Jill Carnahan. Dr. Jill was the first person that actually began to shed some light on the problem. What I do is listen to the patient and we together talk about what else is possible. I don't know why I'm crying. <laughs> she saved my life. The deepest lessons and most profound insights come in the suffering, come in the dark moments. Self-compassion is the healing transition that, that shifts something inside of us. It's actually the thing that we need most in order to heal. Dr. Patient. Available now at drpatientmovie.com. Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we delve into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, innovators, and those who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding you on your journey to optimal health. Hey guys, if you've been around me at all, you know my movie, the documentary, Dr. Patient is now out. Just have to mention this because so many of you have been giving me feedback about how it's been inspiring and transformational. And I want to be sure that those of you who have not yet seen the movie, drpatientmovie.com, you can gift it, you can rent it, you can buy it, you can pay what you want. Um, but I hope you enjoy that. And I would love to hear your feedback after you've had a chance to watch it. All right, so today I'm super excited to have a special guest, Dr. Christy Sutton. She lives and practices in Dallas, Texas. She's an author, teacher, and clinician, and pioneer in the world of natural health, genetic testing, and nutrigenomics. She works to make complicated topics easy to understand and promotes a realistic, hands-on approach to conquer and avoid health challenges. She created the Genetic Detoxification Report and wrote the groundbreaking book that we're going to talk about, The Iron Curse and Genetic Testing, Defining Your Path to a Personalized Health Plan. Currently, she teaches cutting-edge labrogenomics. I haven't heard that word. I love it. I made it up. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. Educational workshops that brings depths and insight and clinical pearls. And today, we're going to talk about iron. Um, before we dive into the topic, Christy, tell us a little bit about your journey. I know you have a very personal story about how did you really get into this? Um, what led you to write the book, The Iron Curse? Great. Thank you. So, um, well, personally... I have struggled with low iron issues from digestive issues primarily, and then, you know, just being a female menstruating, all of that stuff that causes low iron. And so I've always been interested in looking at iron levels and would early in my practice run labs, including all the full iron panel, um, and would occasionally see people that had high iron. And I would usually say, you know, you just should go donate blood. I didn't really, I hadn't really thought through it fully, but I I recognized it and I thought I was addressing it, but I didn't really truly understand what it meant and how to identify why and manage that until I married a man that had undiagnosed hereditary hemochromatosis, which is where you have a gene that causes you to have an increased iron absorption. And I knew that he had problems with high iron before identifying the issues with the gene because he would bring home labs from his doctor, his primary care doctor, and he would have high ferritin and somewhat high liver enzymes and high hemoglobin, hematocrit, red blood cells. Things were not in a good place, but the doctor never said anything about it. And 
but I would tell him, you know, you need to donate blood, you need to donate blood. And, and, but we didn't have a real regimented plan for monitoring, managing. Um, and it wasn't really until the liver enzymes kept creeping up that we finally went through the process of getting him properly diagnosed and treated. And he got diagnosed and treated much earlier than he would have had we not been proactive, but it was our own volition. Like he was being completely ignored by his medical doctor, his primary care. And so we, you know, we started at the gastroenterologist and I, uh, well, I should back up. I realized we really needed to take a different course. Also, when I was writing my first book, The Genetic Testing, Defining Your Path to a Personalized Health Plan book, because when I was writing that book and creating that genetic detoxification report that goes along with the book, I realized that he has a hem- he inherited a hemochromatosis gene. And then I was like, aha moment. This is why my husband has problems with high iron. You know, it's not just because he's, you know, eating red meat, you know, which we yeah. eat red meat, like, at a normal rate, whatever that is, but not like excessively. We're not like carnivores only eat red meat. So then I realized, aha, he's got, you know, this gene. And so we went to the gastroenterologist and I gave him all the labs. At this point in time, I had ordered some extra labs to kind of try to um, get a better picture of what's going on. Why is he not feeling well? Why is he tired? You know, why are his liver enzymes high? And the gastroenterologist, um, you know, listened to me. And then I think, you know, didn't really buy into what I was telling him as far as the iron and the hemochromatosis. And, and I was, um, you know, this was a while ago. I think this was probably 2016 or so. And so I was a much longer, younger clinician and I was still kind of, you know, a little bit more, um, uh, what's the word? I was a little bit more standoffish and it wasn't really as confident. Um, and so anyways, the gastroenterologist decided to, um, you know, go through all the diagnostic tests that he runs, understandably. So we got misdiagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis. Mm -hmm. He was going to let us have that misdiagnosis for a year. The only reason we got unmisdiagnosed is because I ordered extra labs, um, which came back negative and they were like, oh, that was a misdiagnosis. Liver enzymes are getting worse smooth muscle antibodies are negative. Okay. Yeah. And then finally the gastroenterologist circles back around and says, okay, well, you, the ultrasound says you have mild fatty liver. You're just overweight. You need to lose weight, you know, eat better. Um, but I'm going to refer you to the hematologist because you have high red blood cells. And I think you have polycythemia vera, which is, you know, a genetic issue where you just make too many red blood cells. Now he didn't have polycythemia vera. He got they did the genetic testing at the hematologist, but as soon as I gave the hematologist the labs and the genes, he was like, oh, this is easy, hereditary hemochromatosis. We're going to rule out polycythemia vera, but this is hereditary hemochromatosis. And, you know, he looked at the whole picture and said, okay, this is probably why, you know, his testosterone's low and his liver enzymes are high and his DHEA is high and his cortisol is high. And so we're going to get him treated for this and probably all of that's going to get better. And it was like, oh, thank God. God. And so then we get him treated for the hemochromatosis and he does improve greatly, but his DHEA and cortisol are still high. And it's like, why is that? Well, we don't know. I I had attributed it to stress, maybe high iron, you know, typical things because it would go high and then back to normal and then high. So then we go, we get referred to the endocrinologist and that's where we discover, you know, the my husband has a pituitary tumor that was causing him to have um, high cortisol by secreting the, the pituitary tumor was secreting ACTH, causing him to have high cortisol. So, so um, which was also an, the interesting part of that story is that like the initial visit with the endocrinologist, I give her the whole I give her the whole spiel, and at this point in time, I'm kind of like realizing I have to give the medical information because my husband doesn't know what to say. And, and then because he doesn't know what to say, the doctors are not like maybe getting the right information. So I kind of like let my husband give his information. And then I'm like, okay, so this is what's going on. And I ended that conversation that, you know, debriefing for lack of a better word with, and I think my husband has Cushing's disease because uh, I raised up his shirt and he had like these little striae, right. Which happens. And, and, my husband had always said that they were um, 
they were stretch marks from when he gained a bunch of weight in college and then he lost the weight and and it, it was all he had this big anxiety attack in college where he gained all this weight and then eventually he lost the weight and you know he got put on anxiety megs so when i told the endocrinologist you know i think he has cushings she was like no his he doesn't look like someone with cushings you know he wasn't a yeah. really that typical like super yeah. he was overweight but not overweight like cushings right. you know all bloated and although he got bigger and bigger with time um and interesting his blood sugar was totally normal which people that have high cortisol cushings tend to have high blood sugar because cortisol increases blood sugar so his blood sugar his hemoglobin a1c was in the fours he's always had normal blood sugar so he was like a very atypical case again they say oh we caught this so early in my mind i'm like i don't know that we did i think this started in college yes. and but i guess where i really started putting the dots together is when i was researching for the iron curse and i was even having, you know, lived through seeing my husband have this, get much more sophisticated at diagnosing this in patients and realizing, oh, we have like an epidemic of undiagnosed hemochromatosis. I was shocked by the number of health problems that hemochromatosis can cause. And one of the things that it can do is it can damage the anterior pituitary gland and we know it creates a lot of oxidative stress throughout the body, but it really can damage the anterior pituitary gland. It doesn't damage the posterior pituitary gland. And so the place that my husband's tumor occurred on was the anterior pituitary gland. I think my husband just had high iron, oxidative stress, you know, low free radicals, perfect storm, and that allowed this tumor to grow. So, um, so eventually he got the tumor removed and and then he got the tumor removed again. And hopefully that chapter is behind us, you know, ask me in a couple of years and I'll tell you. Um, but so that's, that, that was kind of, that's my introduction. <laughs> what, what a story. And it makes so much sense. First of all, um, I'm conventional medicine trained, but I know that my colleagues and even myself, how we're trained. It's so, your story is not unique. And I'm sure listeners can relate to where they go in and let's start here because this is one really important thing. And then I want to dive into hemochromatosis and how could it look and what are symptoms and signs and how could someone who might fear they have this actually get tested. But before we do that, there's something that happened to you. And again, I want to talk about this because it's not uncommon. And it's almost like medical gaslighting where you come in with a real concern and um, maybe it's like you were the spouse, right? Um, and I can just see most, they roll their eyes, they shrug, you know, they put their arms on in front of you and they're kind of like, oh, whatever, you, you're you jumping to conclusions. But the truth is the patient and especially their spouse, their spouse or loved ones, they know, they know what, and it's the same as a parent bringing a child in, right? And saying, something's not right with my baby. Something's not right with my child. I've heard that over and over and over again. And later they find out the mother knew, right? And just like you as a spouse knew. So for those listeners, um, and you said this, the thing that is so relevant too, is that in the beginning, you weren't an advocate for yourself because you're like a little unsure. I've been that way too in a doctor's office and I'm a doctor, right? So let's talk mm -hmm. just a little bit about that. What advice would you give someone who has a real concern? And um, there's Dr. Google now. So some people come in and the concerns aren't real and then you want to listen, but how do you find a advocate in a physician that will listen and take your uh, concerns seriously? It is so hard. It is so hard. Um, I mean, I was medical gaslit today, <laughs> like, and it, I think you have to go in prepared. Um, you have to get second opinions. You have to go in with a list of questions that you have to stick to your guns and really, um, d don't be afraid, but it's very easy to get afraid and intimidated, um, especially in a medical office, because even me, like, having a reasonable medical understanding, I still, you know, will sometimes get intimidated, like, oh, maybe, maybe you are right. You're, right. you are the expert. And then, and then often go back and realize like, oh, actually they were not right. That I was right. I should have listened to my gut. So, um, I think you really have to get second opinions. Um, that is hard because we live in a world where it's hard to get that first opinion, you yeah. know, to get in with the expert and then get the imaging and the testing. And what really is disturbing is not just like the initial gaslighting, but what I'm seeing a lot of, and this is the case, not just with the iron labs, but with imaging in general is like, they'll get imaging that shows something is wrong, 
but they'll still dismiss that as like, oh, well, that's a normal anomaly. It's like, well, I'm having symptoms related yeah, exactly. to like the part of my body that has a normal anomaly. Can we talk about that? You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> Take aspirin. <laughs> hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. So true. I love those things you shared, even like making a list, sticking to that, getting your questions answered, being your own. And sometimes what I think was really powerful for you, and I've seen this as we did the documentary and did patient, follow patient stories, one of the really key stories there was a patient who had been suffering and gaslit for almost 20 years and found his wife ended up being his advocate, just like your situation, and where he didn't wasn't able to advocate for himself. Maybe you can bring someone with you to actually take notes or to ask the questions. And I love that because then together you can kind of have this camaraderie of someone, you know, that information. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can bring somebody that has a medical background, that can be very helpful too. Yeah. So thanks for sharing that story. And it's so interesting because again, I experience this too so often, unfortunately for your husband and your experience, but the beautiful thing that came out of it is your deep understanding and knowledge in the book that you've written and educating people. So let's talk about hemochromatosis. Um, the standard thing, of course, is two copies of, there's two genes they standardly test. You and I know there's a lot more, so you can talk briefly about that. But um, I'll just tell a quick story because I've had a patient, um, she was about 14 when she came in and she had total, uh, alopecia totalis. That means hair loss, whole entire head. Turns out we did a big workup and I like you check everybody's iron and sometimes genetics. And she ended up having hemochromatosis and that was the cause of her hair loss. And she's actually growing her hair back now that we've treated it. So it's pretty profound because it's one of those things that unless you were looking for it, even me, I'm I mean, I want to be a great doctor, but sometimes those things you don't think of, but I do check everybody's iron and I do check the genes if the iron's high. So let's go to symptoms. What would someone maybe, um, this can affect so many organs. So can you give us kind of a glimpse of what they might be experiencing if they should ask more questions or get their iron checked? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I also was just thinking about how, where do people typically go when they have hair loss? They often go to like a dermatologist. And dermatologists don't do iron labs. Mm -hmm. yes. And so they're 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 not even looking for all of the possible causes, which is why this idea that we can compartmentalize health into, well, this is my area of expertise, I, you know, this is what I do, and then you do that. It's like, well, the body doesn't care. <laughs> we all have to be really good, um, you know, just regular general practitioners and look at the whole body. Unfortunately, people, there was somebody that said, and I can't remember who it was, said doctors are becoming experts, such so specific, and they know so much about one thing that they end up knowing everything about nothing. And I think that that's true, especially with some of these real specific uh -huh. experts. So anyways, back to your question, the, which is a very good question. Like, what are some of the symptoms that you can look for? A lot of the symptoms, um, you don't even want to wait until you have them because the earliest symptoms are on labs and those show up before you have physical symptoms. Now, the which is why everybody needs to get thorough lab testing that includes an iron panel every single year at a minimum. And then they need it. I, I think because 30% of the population has a hemochromatosis gene, I think that's a high enough percent of the population that we just screen people. Yes. At least Caucasians. But I've seen that just because it's in a higher amount in Caucasians. But I've seen that gene in like all different ethnicities yes. because, you know, the Viking Celtic ancestors have gotten their genetic pool throughout the world. Um, so labs are the key for diagnosis. However, the symptoms that you want to look for, um, if 
if a doctor ever says, oh, your liver enzymes are slightly high, or if you know your iron slightly high, okay, it's time to do the full iron panel. It's time to get the genes. But the other symptoms, you know, it's really common to have fatigue, joint pain, because the iron gets into the joints. Um, it can also cause fatigue because it can damage your heart. And then your heart has a hard time pumping blood because it's not working very well. It's damaged. And fixing the iron often decreases heart rate and increases heart rate variability. Um, it will destroy your liver. There's 200 times increased risk for liver cancer with people that have hereditary hemochromatosis untreated. Um, it will destroy your um, pancreas, causing type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So a lot of people, you know, they have diabetes, but they're never diagnosed with the cause of the diabetes. Um, it can cause infertility uh, by destroying the pituitary gland, the ovaries, the testes, cause low sperm count, low quality sperm count, destroy the, o the ovaries. Um, so if you see like, I, I see this a lot, women who have hereditary hemochromatosis and, you know, they get diagnosed and treated, and then they still continue to have a lower than normal AMH for their age. And I think that's because they had partly, I wonder, I don't have data to confirm it, but I've seen it enough where it's like, oh, I think maybe that low AMH, which we know can be caused by the high iron, is actually a result of having the undiagnosed hemochromatosis for so long when they were younger. Um, if you're young and you develop high iron, it can stunt your growth. Um, it can cause your skin to get bronze from the iron accumulating. Um, it can destroy your brain, causing brain fog, increasing your risk for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, difficulty healing up from traumatic brain injuries, concussions, um, bipolar, you know, schizophrenia, depression. In fact, Ernest Hemingway he had undiagnosed hemochromatosis, committed suicide. He was so miserable. He was depressed, wow. had this horrible joint pain and diabetes. They didn't realize that's what it was until after he had committed suicide and he was at the Mayo Clinic. So um, it's profound, the number of things that, and, and I've gotten some criticism with the book. I get, a, I get a number of things. One, people criticize me because I'm a chiropractor, which I'm like, well, that's a low ball hit. Can you at least like criticize what's in the book? Um, and then the second criticism is that I'm just saying that everything, hemochromatosis causes everything. And I'm like, well, I would just put the things that were documented on PubMed. I'm just, don't shoot the messenger here. Like, just because I did a thorough job, including all the things it can cause, doesn't mean that I'm wrong. Like, it means that I think the medical profession needs to expand their understanding of what this looks like so that they can do a better job diagnosing and treating something that's easy to screen for, diagnose, treat, and manage. So I love that because that is, uh, and if we look at like mold-related illness or autoimmunity, some of these things that I deal with as well, they have these huge multi-system, multi-symptom list of things because they affect every organ, right? If it's an immune system issue or, so it makes sense that something like iron overload would affect organs and many, many, many symptoms. Um, and what you're not saying is that everybody has it. You're saying, why don't we test and actually screen for this? I couldn't agree more. And again, I, most of my colleagues in functional medicine, and I know for me, I am always checking a full iron panel, at least at the first visit. And if there's any inkling of something wrong, I'll go to the genetics. Um, let's talk just a little bit about labs. What would be the basics? I mean, we know you and I know what the iron panel is, but do you want to describe just a little bit about what the labs might look like if someone is abnormal so that they could take it to their doctor? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you know this, typically when you go into a doctor and they order labs, they don't order a full iron panel. They will often include just a serum iron. Maybe if you're lucky, they'll include a ferritin, but that is not everything in the iron panel. They, they tend to always order like a CBC, giving you red blood cells, hemoglobin, hematocrit. Those are important because it is common for people with hemochromatosis to have high red blood cells, hemoglobin, and hematocrit because they're, they have so much iron they're storing. These are like iron hoarders and they have to find places to put it. And so they often will put it in the blood in the red blood cells, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. So those will often go up, not all the time, but often they'll go up. Um, so if you see any of that on a CBC, which is commonly ordered, that's a red flag 
we need to make sure we get the iron panel and jeans. Now, the full iron panel has the serum iron, which is just like a snapshot. Um, and you want to always do that fasting because if you eat, that can affect the amount of iron in your blood at the time of the blood test. And then it has the ferritin, which is more of like a stored iron. And ferritin can be misleading because it can go up with inflammation too. But if you look at the ferritin with the rest of the iron panel, that can tell you, is this because of just inflammation or is this because of iron accumulating, which also increases inflammation? So ferritin, we I don't ever like to see ferritin over 100. The research is very clear. If it gets over 200, that's absolutely going to decrease your quality and longevity of life. A lot of lab ranges allow it to go into the three or 400s. So mm-hmm. I don't ever like to see it above 100. And there is some research in the book to support that. The other part of the iron panel is the TIBC and the UIBC and the iron saturation. The most important labs to look at for diagnosing hemochromatosis is the iron saturation, which can also be called the transferrin saturation. And that is just looking at the amount of iron in the blood, how much iron is in your blood. If your iron saturation is 45 or higher, that's too high. Okay. Most labs allow iron saturation to go above 45 before they screen it. I know the lab corp that I use allows it to go up to 55. And I just, you know, in my, and for a long time, I allowed that to mess me up. I was missing hemochromatosis because I was following the lab ranges. And then I realized, oh, the technical cutoff is 45% with hemochromatosis. Why did the labs allow it to go to 55? I don't know, but you have to know 45% iron saturation is the cutoff. And if you have that high iron saturation with um, a high ferritin, which is a relative term, but if, if it's high, a lot of these hemochromatosis people, it's not relative at all. Like they're four, five, six hundred, thousands. That's not at all relative. You know, some people say, oh, you're too low with 100. I don't think so. I've never seen somebody's health get worse because I got them below 100 or they got below 100. I've seen a lot of people's health improve because their ferritin got below 100. And ferritin at 100 is high enough that like if that's from iron levels, like you have a pretty good storage there. So so that's kind of the it that's why it's so frustrating. Literally what you need is an iron panel to diagnose it. You always want to get that CBC too. Mm -hmm. And then if those are out of range at all, next step, get the hemochromatosis genes. It's not that hard. There's just a lot of miseducation and myths. Like, I don't know if you're ready to talk about the carrier myth, the idea that yeah, yeah. Let's jump in. And I just have one question on um, the, so once in a while we'll see high iron and low ferritin. What do you make of that? So high- like a high iron saturation and low ferritin. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the, probably the hardest one because um, you have, there's a couple of things you want to look at. So sometimes that will happen when you get like the red blood cells are breaking, they're lysing. And then that will allow a lot of iron to get into the blood. So like, I don't have a huge Lyme population in Texas with my patients, but you probably have a growing number in Colorado. Um, So you'll see that sometimes with people that have like chronic infection issues where their red blood cells are lysing, whether it's, you know, Lyme, Borrelia or Babesia or whatever. Um, those are not the only things that can cause it, but sometimes you'll see that. And that's like those red blood cells are breaking and it's allowing the iron to get out. But overall, the ferritin's getting lower. So they're becoming more anemic. It's just showing up high in the blood. Another thing, sometimes um, if you're if you're seeing hemochromatosis patients that are like removing a lot of blood in a quick manner, sometimes... Yeah their ferritin can get low, but the iron saturation goes up because their body is like mobilizing iron and like their body thinks they're dying from blood loss. And so the body will increase iron absorption 
and increase iron mobilization and you'll get this like temporary low ferritin, high iron saturation sometimes in those people. Okay. So, but that's always like the hardest one to yes. figure out. I would agree. Cause again, I do this every day. Now those are always like, huh, is that what else is going on? Is this chronic? And you know, so I totally, I loved your explanation. Uh, Cause I think even for me as a seasoned clinician, it's still sometimes puzzling of like, what's going on in this situation with these weird um, but thanks for explaining that makes so much sense um, because it's really like the carrier, right? The ferritin or the released in the blood. And that makes sense of it going down and then ferritin. Um, okay. So genetics, um, and then we'll talk about what do you do about this? And I just want to mention something you talked about earlier that I think is important. This 14 year old, you know, I treated and you treated your husband, the earlier we get the diagnosis, we literally know the statistics of someone with hemochromatosis undiagnosed. They're almost guaranteed to have liver failure at some point in life if they're never diagnosed. And what you just described earlier was all the different organ systems. This gets stuck in the organs. So you could probably make a case for almost any organ could get over accumulation of iron. And that's why it's so diverse in the symptoms. But say someone like the 14-year-old, literally, I was almost in tears with the mother because she realized this 14-year-old didn't have liver failure, right? And because, not really accidentally because I checked, but because of the hair loss, we checked, we found this, we probably prevented lifelong significant things like your husband experiences. And we were just talking together. What a miracle that we found this at 14. So yes. you should be screening anyone who has anything abnormal, anyone who has a family history, which speaking of, let's go into genetics because one of the things you and I talked about is two copies are going to show up as positive. What about one copy? Let's talk about the genetics here. Yeah. Yeah. I do want to mention something while you said that about the 14 year old that was having hair loss. What a gift, not just to her for the rest of her life to have something that's easy to manage and treat, di properly diagnosed, um, but also a gift to the rest of her family who now they can learn from that and get screened and tested. However, you have probably seen this. I have seen this more than I'd like to often after diagnosing somebody with having this gene, I will, I'll say, Hey, you have this gene, even if their iron levels are normal, I'll always say, Hey, you have this gene, this needs to be on your radar and you need to talk to your family members because they all need to be screened for you got this from somewhere and it's in your family and they all need to be screened for. And oftentimes they'll tell me their family members, family history. I'm like, they have, they have it. Yeah. That's their problem. And they, their family members will dismiss it for whatever reason. And I often the reason is, well, my doctor would be telling me about it if it was a problem. And it's like, no, that is not true. But I can't, you know, I can only talk to the pe person in front of me. I can't talk to the family members who are, you know, not sitting there. So, but it is a gift to the whole family if you can diagnose this properly because it doesn't have to be a health problem. You know, it's only a problem to have this gene if your iron levels get too high. The iron curse of having high iron, you know, having this hemochromatosis gene, it, it's been a protective shield for many people. You know, it protects from low iron, which has killed a lot of people. Um, so there's a reason that this gene exists and there's a reason it exists in such a large percent of the population. It is protective. And it is protective for the most important thing in evolution. It's protective to get you through pregnancy and childbearing years and through childhood where you're eating a lot of calcium rich foods that bind iron and make you low in iron. And, you know, when you're growing as a child, you consume, you know, iron gets depleted rapidly. This is why if you're anemic and low in iron, you'll often be smaller, or shorter, ta shorter stature. So this gene and then the, the, the issue with evolution is that once you're done having kids, like evolution doesn't have a way to screen for bad genes. You know, this is why hemochromatosis, high iron tends to be more of a problem later in life. Yes. Um, but. 50 and 60 year old women are not having kids. So it's like, who cares? Evolution can't do anything about that. It's the same thing with like the Alzheimer's gene. You know, the Alzheimer's gene often as kids, these kids will have higher IQs 
And, you know, they will, they've even been shown to have a higher survivor, sur survivability during pregnancy and in acute infections. But who cares? You know, genetic, the evolution doesn't care that you die of, you know, Alzheimer's and, you know, have Alzheimer's in your 70s or 80s because they're not having kids. So that's kind of a little bit of a tangent, but I'll get back to what you originally asked, which was the genetic piece. And I did want to mention, you know, I, my colleague had a five-year-old with undiagnosed hereditary hemochromatosis that she had two genes, two of the H63D, both of her parents are Irish. And so she got two of them. It's very high in the Irish population. That's why I say that. Um, but and as a five-year-old, she was having neurological problems and di we, we diagnosed it. And then she went to the pediatrician who was a good pediatrician, but they didn't know what to do about it. They'd never seen it before because they're not doing full iron panels. I just want to say we had the same thing. The pediatrician had no clue. Now they went to us, but, but then even the specialist was the gastroenterologist, the liver specialist, right? And they basically only saw adults. So I had the same exact situation where like a pediatric gastroenterologist doesn't usually deal with this because very few clinicians are diagnosing, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. The only reason this pediatrician even saw this patient was because the mom diagnosed her. Um, and so the pediatrician was like, I don't know what to do. I'm referring you to a, a pediatric hematologist who they primarily see, you know, cancer patients. Yeah. And so they're not really seeing hemochromatosis patients because they're not getting diagnosed, not because they don't exist. They're not right. being diagnosed. So it was, it was very, going back to it's hard to get in with a specialist. Yeah. It is very hard to get in with a pediatric hematologist, especially if you're coming in with hemochromatosis and not like, you know, deadly leukemia. There's a ranking here and hemochromatosis is not at the top, not because it's not important. It's just not at the top of the ranking. So they finally get in. By the time they get in, you know, I talked to the mom about there's some things you need to be doing to lower this kid's iron. And we adjusted her supplement protocol and gave her a really high amount of curcumin to bind to the iron and lower it. And by the time she went to see the pediatric hematologist, um, the, her iron levels were normal, like the liver enzymes were better. Um, things were looking much better. And then the pediatric hematologist was like, why are you here? You're fine. Um, if it goes back up to over 45% iron saturation, you know, let me know and we'll treat it then. And then stop. The, this is what the pediatric hematologist said. Stop giving her those supplements. They're not doing anything. So the mom cut back significantly to like a fourth of what she was giving supplement wise on the curcumin. And then they rechecked, I think about six weeks later, and the iron levels had gone back up, you know. And yeah. over 45% iron saturation. Okay. So they message, I actually have this message conversation in the book in the case study on juvenile hemochromatosis. And then they message the pediatric hematologist and they're like, hey, we're we're in the bad range again. We stopped giving the supplements and can we come in and get treated? Because the mom wanted them to do, you know, like remove blood. Exactly. Yeah, which you can't do on a child. Yes. So so the pediatric hematologist emailed her back messaging saying, I, I mean, I have it in the book. It's unbelievable, but totally gaslighting. Oh. Let me just, that that's, that's the, that hundred percent gaslighting. I mean, you can read it if you want, but that's what it is. It was disturbingly gaslighting. Um, and so the mom, you know, and they referred her back to the pediatric, to the pediatrician that referred pe the child to the pediatric hem hematologist. It's like, you don't like, they referred to you. Why are you referring them back? So the mom's dealing with it. Yeah. And the mom, you know, will go and order like all these extensive labs just to get blood out of her child. Yeah. And um, it's not ideal. You know, she's doing it with supplements. It's really hard. Um, so we're like, can't wait till that child starts menstruating, um, which is, you know, coming. But because um, that's like natural blood loss. But I totally digress there. So I, I do want to answer your actual question, which was, the genes, which are really important. So there are three hemochromatosis genes. There's probably more, but there's three that have been, you know, there's actually I, many, many, many I've done some, but you're right that there's two that, um, there's three big ones you can go on. Yeah. And say. If you do some of those big extensive genetic tests, the HFE is usually what it stands like HFE is how they notate them. And some of these genetic tests that you can order out have like 20 of them, but only a few yeah. are really significant. Yeah. For the sake of just yeah. not 
you know, complicating it any further. I'm just going to be simple minded and say there's three. Because like if you go to LabCorp and you get a hemochromatosis test at this point in time, they check for those three. It used to be they just checked for the two, the top two. And then with enough research, they added that third one. Mm -hmm. And so there's three hemochromatosis genes. And there's a lot to say about these. But basically, there's this myth that if you have one of those genes, if you only inherit one from one parent, you're a carrier and you will never die. You will never have a problem because you only inherited one gene. And that is a myth because in order to be a carrier, you don't ever have health problems. And there are a lot of people with only one hemochromatosis gene that do develop high iron because even if you only have one hemochromatosis gene, that one gene will increase your iron absorption. And then it's just a matter of, okay, how much iron are you getting in your diet? How much are you absorbing? It, it, at that point in time, it's all environmental. So this is a myth that has led to a lot of people being gaslit and misdiagnosed and mistreated and allowed to progress. Um, and um, it's a very pervas pervasive myth that has released, you know, it, it's CDC, Mayo Clinic, you know, the whole thing, they, they're they full on board with this myth. Um, and I think that's largely because clinicians are not the ones who are like writing the the information for screening. This is, you know, governing bodies that haven't probably treated a patient in, you know, a decade. But um so I did, that's not really what we're talking about here. So, but those three hemochromatosis genes are really important. Um, and there's three of them. The first one is uh, HFE C282Y. And that's the one that is the most uh, strong at increasing iron absorption. And so the worst genetic combination is if you inherit two of those C282Ys, and then you're going to have a really high risk for getting high iron. Those are the people that tend to get diagnosed because they, they're they the most obvious. You know, the people who don't tend to get diagnosed are less obvious. Um, those are people with maybe one C282Y or one of the other genes that are not quite as strong at increasing iron absorption. So the second gene is HFE H63D. And a huge amount of the population has one of those genes. And a lot of people that get hemochromatosis, that's the only gene they have. Um, it's a lower risk than the C282Y, but because there's so many people with that genetic type, it's very common to see that genetic type. Is that the gene that you have? Yes, mm -hmm. I have one. You just, yeah, one HFE, h 63 d Yeah, that's the most common one. And then the third one is HFE S65C. And that one, because it's a little bit newer in the research, there's not as much, most research just looks at the two. So I can't like really spout off a lot of statistics about that one, but we do know that it decreases iron, it, it, it increases iron absorption, but less than the other two. And it needs to be taken seriously and screened for. Um, and if you have one of those, then you are at an increased risk for developing hemochromatosis, high iron. Thanks for explaining that. So for those of you listening, if you're, if you've ever had high iron or any sort of liver issues, these are things you can ask your doctor to test for. It's a genetic test. It's easily available on Quest, LabCorp, any hospital lab, Mayo Clinic, you name it, they're going to have this. And I love that they've added that because I remember back 20 years ago, getting just the first two, I think recently I've been seeing all three of them, but uh, at least at LabCorp, you said it's there. So in our last few minutes, let's talk about treatment. Um, and I want to frame that because one of the things you mentioned, but I wanted to make sure it's obvious to our listeners, if you're, let's say, for example, you're a menstruating woman, you're going to be more risk before you have periods because periods are your natural reproductive way of getting rid of excess iron. So I would say, and I'd love to hear your opinion, Dr. Christie, generally women who are menstruating, especially if they have heavy periods, are a little bit less likely to have a risk of iron overload. But then as soon as you hit menopause, there's this massive inflammation, loss of hormones, and a whole bunch of things, like a symphony that happens. But one of the things we know, there's a much higher risk of heart attack, liver issues after menopause. And I'm assuming these women are at more risk as well because they're no longer losing blood. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. The, it's the elevated iron, and then it's probably the combo of like all the other hormones 
crashing the estrogen and progesterone crashing and testosterone crashing while the iron goes up, which is never a good combination. Um, but yeah, the, um, let's see, there were a lot of things I wanted to say. The, the first question you asked was, what was it again? Sorry, the suck treatments, because oh, I, I took you oh, off on a tangent there. Let's it's okay. Uh, there was something. Oh, I want to talk about the, the, the menstruation thing for a second. Okay. Okay. You can have high iron. You can have a hemochromatosis gene and develop low iron. Okay. Just because you have that gene doesn't mean you're going to get low. You're going to get high iron. You can become low in iron if like you have a heavy menstrual cycle. You know, maybe you have a GI bleed. Maybe you're just not absorbing iron because you have digestive issues. Um, maybe, you know, there's something you're doing in your life that's causing or something that's happening in your life that's causing you to not absorb or keep enough iron in your body. So um, just because you have one of those genes doesn't mean you're going to have hemochromatosis. You can actually get low. But what generally happens is you'll go on like a roller coaster. So like the high levels of iron tend to decrease during pregnancy, during childbearing years, because you're menstruating or you're pregnant if you're a female. And females, when they're pregnant, they get low in iron because being pregnant is an iron depleting event. It uses a tremendous amount of iron. So even women that have these hemochromatosis genes often have to take iron during pregnancy just because yes. they get low in iron. So it's not like the genes are your destiny. You still have to look at the labs and the environmental situations. Having said that, if like this just happened to me, you know, I had a um, postmenopausal female stopped menstruating like six or seven years ago. And she, I was shocked to see she had a hemochromatosis gene because she's was extremely anemic and had been for a long time. And I'm like, you should not be this anemic. You're not menstruating. You have a hemochromatosis gene. There is something wrong here. Um, and, you know, she let, I, she had been, for lack of a better word, you know, medically gaslit for a long time before that. I think that we probably see that a lot because patients tend to come to us after they, they've already had a bad experience elsewhere. So, um, but it's important to know that during childbearing years, you tend to get lower. And then after you stop menstruating, things tend to go higher. Now, men, men tend to have more problems than women because they never menstruate and they don't have, you know, they don't give birth to children. So they're at a lower risk for getting low in iron and a higher risk for getting high in iron. Thanks for explaining that. And it's a perfect example because I have that one gene, right? So I'm not the full blown, but I have a risk of hemochromatosis. And because in my twenties I had cancer and then Crohn's disease, malabsorption, inflammation, I was anemic for decades. And then uh, perimenopause when I got healthy and my gut's fine and all that, I started seeing high iron for the first time in maybe late thirties, early forties. And that's when I checked. So it's kind of like my end of one is exactly what you're saying. I wouldn't have ever seen it or checked for it because it was... Uh, a little bit uh, misleading because I was anemic for a lot of years. And then once I got rid of the gut issues and the malabsorption and the Crohn's and all of that, um, the iron started to go up. So it's that's actually relevant if you're a woman and you've had anemia in the past. It doesn't mean that you don't have hemochromatosis. I uh, Or it doesn't mean you don't have the gene. Yeah, because you, you could still have the gene and hemochromatosis. I actually have Crohn's disease too. And I have, you know, often wished I had a hemochromatosis gene yeah. because... Um, of the malabsorption issues that come with Crohn's. And one thing I've noticed, I know you said you look at genes a little bit. Um, I look a lot at the celiac gene too. And one thing I've noticed is like, I've only seen one Crohn's patient without at least one celiac gene. Do you have a celiac gene? I do. I love that you say that I have DQ2. Uh, two okay, I have DQ8, which is rarer, yeah. Yeah. but they both, I've never, I have one person and she's like the weirdest Crohn person. I'm uh -huh. like, I don't even know if you have Crohn's, but- <laughs> Um, it's just like, you know, it's that one anomaly. I'm like, I don't know about that, but, um, every other person I've seen has a celiac gene and they have to stay off of gluten. I actually think, um, and I wonder if you have the same thought, but I actually think that had I never, had I been told at a young age, cause I was diagnosed at 16, they took out part of my small intestine and, you know, it was, yeah. it was bad. 
Um, I actually think if I had been taken off of a gluten-free diet at a young age, probably like a small child, then I would have never had been diagnosed with Crohn's or had that surgery where they, where they removed the last foot of my small intestine. Um, so I think that's very possible. I love that we're just digressing a bit because both you and I know what this is like. I think that there's a definite connection. Um, gosh, I could go on for a while, but let's get to treatments before the. Oh yeah. Sorry. Okay. So treatments for high iron. So in, first of all, anybody that has like hemochromatosis, it is in your best interest to get in with a hematologist because they're going to be able to remove blood like at the right frequency and the right rate and the right volume. If you, you know, well, you're a medical doctor, so you can, you know, remove blood. I, I can't remove blood. I have, you know, maybe people can go donate blood, but some people can't donate blood. And so if, you know, there's other ways around that, which I go through in the Iron Curse protocols, but it is always a good idea to have a hematologist manage any hemochromatosis as a part of the team because um, this is a lifelong condition that needs to be like screened. You need to have regular lab testing and the hematologists are good about saying you need to get in here and do labs um, and really specific about it. Now I have seen some bad hematologists out there, but there, you know, there are some really good ones too. So the step there, there's, multiple steps to, you know, lowering the iron and treatments in the iron curse protocol as part of the book. The first step is remove blood if you can. Um, and that is the primary tool that uh, traditional, you know, medicine uses to treat hemochromatosis. It is a very effective tool. However, you know, there's limitations to it. You can only remove so much blood. So some people that have like really horrible hemochromatosis, you know, their ferritins and like a thousand plus, they cannot get enough blood out of them to get all that iron out before they become low in red blood cells and anemic and, you know, can't function. And so they get into this situation where the, they're unable to remove blood, but they're just kind of plateaued, still having high blood and they kind of feel helpless. And the, you know, the doctor's like, well, we have to wait till your hemoglobin and red blood cells come back up. Now, during that interim, and even well, as soon as you find out you have high iron, this is where you want to look at like the other steps in the iron curse protocols. So, you know, you can look at dietary intake. If you're trying to lower iron, decreasing the amount of red meat you're eating is going to help because red meat is the highest source of absorbable iron because it has heme iron, which is very absorbable, whereas vegetables have non-heme iron like spinach, which is not very absorbable. So this is why you don't tend to see vegans and vegetarians get, you know, really high in iron because they might be consuming a lot of iron, but they're not absorbing it. Um, whereas if you eat a small amount of red meat, you're going to get a lot of iron out of that. So anyway, so looking at the, you know, the dietary things, um, even just drinking like coffee or tea with that iron rich meal can certainly uh, help decrease iron absorption. There's a lot of little tips like that. Cut out the extra vitamin C supplements, cut out the NAC, that's going to increase iron absorption. And then there are step three of the Iron Curse Protocols is nutritional supplements. And that's, um, that's I think, a really effective tool to know about that I feel like is being underutilized and like a, a unique part of the book. And so I mentioned the curcumin, cur you know, therapeutic doses of these things often three grams a day or more to help lower, bind the iron and lower it, um, lower the ferritin, lower the inflammation. Um, Silamarin is another supplement that can help bind to iron and lower iron. Silamarin also helps with liver damage, which is yes. uh, Achilles heel of hemochromatosis. Um, let's see, quercetin. Quercetin helps to... Um, decrease iron absorption by increasing uh, something called hepcidin. So when hepcidin gets higher, you decrease iron absorption. People that have a hemochromatosis gene, the reason that they absorb so much iron is because they have low hepcidin. So if you take quercetin or berberine, these things can increase uh, hepcidin and decrease iron absorption. Alpha lipoic acid can um, 
de bind to iron and decrease iron. And that's also great because that can lower blood sugar. It's also really good for your brain and neurons and like, you know, peripheral neuropathy and stuff. So I have a whole list of multiple supplements that, you know, and what they're kind of good for and all that. Now, the next step is lifestyle. Um, and the lifestyle thing is, you know, things like be careful about alcohol intake because alcohol intake will increase iron absorption. Um, try not to pair like vitamin C rich fruits with like red meat because while you're still too high in iron, because that's going to increase iron um, absorption. Um, exercise will lower iron, but you have to be careful to not jump into a serious exercise program while you have undiagnosed you know, hemochromatosis, because it's a stress on the heart. So you really need to be like, watch closely, but that just exercising will help lower iron. Um, interestingly enough, you know, people that, uh, there's a lot of people that get low, lower in iron because they're taking like a, a PPI or they have some digestive issue or so sometimes when you fix a problem, like a gut problem, the unintended consequences oh, now you get high in iron, like what you were saying. Um, and there's so many people on PPIs now that a lot of times that'll make them low in iron, but you might, if somebody gets off a PPI, because you know you fix the underlying problem or whatever, they might like go high. So. That was wonderful. What a great, like really concise in every aspect of it. And of course, if you guys want to know more, go get the iron curse. Dr. Christie is a wealth of knowledge. Um, Dr. Christie, this has been so fun and so relevant. And I remember when I got your book, I thought this is someone I want to talk to because of course, personally, but I see this. And again, I told you that 14 year old, I had, I have many other stories of hemochromatosis, which I've diagnosed and treated. And I know that we're saving lives because this is something that is sometimes missed. Um, so I hope we bring awareness, not only to patients and listeners, but even other physicians listening. If you're not testing out there, if you're a doc, um, go ahead and start. Christy, where can people find you? Where can they get more information about you, your book, your programs, whatever else you have going on? Um, well, the the Iron Curse information, my book, all that, you can go to ironcurse.com and that has more about the book. And then I teach an educational workshop that goes through a lot of what we talked about, plus much more. Um, and then I, my website is drchristysutton.com. So just D-R-C-H-R-I-S-T-Y-S-U-T-T-O-N.com. And that has all the information about, you know, my books and my educational workshops and how to become a patient and all that good stuff. Awesome. So thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. You are such a um, wonderful person to get to talk to because you're so on top, you're so bright and clinically minded. Oh, thank you. And thanks for your work. It really is so important. So if you guys are listening, want to know more, go visit Dr. Christy Sutton for the main site. If you're into your car driving, don't stop and write it down. I'll have it in the show notes. <laughs> so um, Christy, thank you so much for coming by today. Thank you.